Okay, this gentleman here. Hi there. Yeah. Um, so, might be a bit long-winded, but originally, I kind of have been viewing the Trump presidency, the election campaign, as sort of unprecedented in terms of how he's risen, his, how he's accrued power, and how he's been able to, amass, to best use, utilize social media like Twitter, how he's able to dominate the headlines, and he's able to compound that with the social unrest. And originally I was thinking along Marshall McLuhan and Media Mint's message. I'm just going to interrupt for a minute and ask you to keep your question short because there's yep. quite a few lineups. Yep. So if you can get right to the point, that'd be great. Thanks very much. Basically, Media Mint's message, do you feel that Trump is best utilizing the medium and that he understands it better than other politicians do? Or do you feel it's more rhetorical, like William Fisher's narrative paradigm and that he has created a story and that's what's driving the support for him. That's how he's getting his power. And do you feel that's going to continue going forward? Is to this anyone, for any, anyone, anyone, anyone on the panel? Well, I mean, I would just say quickly that I have been extremely impressed by his use of social media in terms of sucking up all the oxygen, if that's been his strategy, and I found it incredibly effective. Um, I felt sorry for um, Jeb Bush when he was really at the end of his line, and he went, he get, had, a, had a town hall meeting, and all they could talk about was asking him questions about Donald Trump. I mean, it was time for Jeb to leave at that point, because... He had just, he was so effective at using media. But I would say, if, if so I'm not a social media person necessarily, but I would say this, uh, I, I do wonder if the scholars in that field are wondering where this is going. And I think that's maybe, an, uh, maybe another thing to think about, that we're probably at early stages of the impacts that this is gonna have. I think he's using it effectively. I think they're using it very effectively in Ottawa too. The present government is quite different with their use of social media. But I, I think we have to sort of watch that space and see what an impact it's gonna have in future elections. I, I think it's kind of every, four years, it seems to be pretty different, the way it's being used, and it's being more advanced and sophisticated. Okay, anyone else on the panel like to comment? No? Good. Okay, we'll take Thank the next you. question over here. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, it was interesting how in the first the part, there was three or four people asking similar question. What should the, the, the progressive left do in order to stop something like this to happen again? You know, we all thought that it wouldn't happen. We all laughed that before. Laugh should be done already, folks. We should be laughing anymore. We should be, we should be worried about how we can stop something like this from happening again. Uh, so I just wonder, is it to continue to use the same theoretical paradigms that from 1960s and so on that surely show like marginal sectors from gender, racial life, or should it be engaging to try to get something else, something new that reveals more what globalization is being le leaving behind? Are we gonna continue to use the same theoretic paradigms from 1960 and perhaps even from 1800 of social class, etc., or are we should be engaging to try to get something new? Okay, Any, so anyone on the panel want to tackle that one? The only, the only thing I would say to that, um, just keep it very quick, is that you know, the right is actually extremely well organized. Uh, it doesn't always, it doesn't always appear that way, but you know, like even if I'll use the example of Canada, I'm, I'm more familiar with that. But uh, over the last few years, in the lead up to uh, uh, when Harper got elected, and then subsequently. Uh, you know, one of the reasons he was able to hold on to power the way that he did was because of how well organized their machinery was in terms of getting into, in particular, universities and getting involved in student activism and, and, and setting up institutions in different, and I'm talking mostly from uh, the Ontario context because that's where I've lived until most recently. I'm not sure what happened here. So they are organized and I think that the left, if, if the, and I, you know, like I was saying in my talk, I'm not, I'm not particularly invested left or right here, but if the left wants to be able to confront that, they need to be just as or more organized. And I think that it's been, in a way, too much of a lull in the last, uh, last few years, uh, certainly in the Obama presidency. And uh, that's why these kind of independent social movements like Black Lives Matter, like I don't know more, 
is is the future. Okay, thanks, Joe. This gentleman. Mel, can I just add oh, sorry, just a quick yep. note? I mean, the only thing I would add on the, from the U.S. side on that is if, if left means Democrat, I'm not sure that it does. We have not ever, sure everyone would agree with that. Democrats were extremely well organized. Um, with the Center for American Progress has been a very big policy institute that's been organized there for about a decade. And the Clintons themselves were a very strong leadership force of the Democrats. So I, I do think that the Democrats have been very well organized. Uh, I'm not sure that that's the full explanation of what happened in that election. Edna? Um, I, I'm, I'm really heartened by uh, Theda Scopel's work, you know, from Harvard University, where she wrote a book on, around 2011 on the Tea Party and the way that it was able to organize. And she's actually written a, a piece talking about how the left, you know, the Democrat, actually she actually talks about the, the Democratic Party, could use that as a way to begin to have local organizations and things. And then, you know, you, uh, you, uh, you may have seen on the web of Indivisible that there are now, um, there, there, there have been uh, staffers, uh, Democratic Party staffers who have now just given sort of how it is that you go about organizing in this way. So Carlos's question about, you know, what theoretical frameworks, I think absolutely, I mean, I think a, a pluralist, more sort of methodologically and theoretically pluralist environment is always important, uh, particularly in the university. But I think for those who are doing hard politics, just find out how the heck the Tea Party was able to stop Obama, and then I think we can start from there. I'll just add that I think it's important to remember just how tight the election was, yeah. not in the yeah. popular vote, but in the way the Electoral College vote worked out, in particular races. It could have easily tipped the other way. Uh, okay, to be a little selfish and turn it back to Canada. So Dr. Carbert talked a little bit about, explained why she doesn't think Trumpism could uh, succeed in Canada. But I was wondering to zoom out a little bit. Uh, to what extent do the, do, do the panelists think that postmodern percep perceptions of truth have sunk into Canadian political sphere specifically? And uh, will, do you think it will be as successful as it was in the United States? I, I'm going to have to think about what postmodern politics would be in this context. I, I, would, um, I would hazard to say that the attempts are, are definitely being made. You know, like we're definitely, we've got Leach and this shark fisherer guy or whatever. Yeah, that's the, right. but that's, it's that's, not, a that's a substantive policy position. What's what? postmodern? Oh, about postmodern? Yeah. Well, okay, well, for, I guess po postmodern in, in that there's no fact, right? Is that, is that, is that yeah. Uh, you mean you see Kelly, Kelly Le Leach, Lech? Leach. Kelly Leach, thank you. Uh, even going on the news in, in America, you know, trying to get like airtime and talking about this thing. And, and I think that the, in Canada, I agree with uh, Professor Carbert that the institutions matter and the political context matter. And in a situation like what we're in right now, when you've got the, <laughs> the big shark guy and uh, <laughs> Kelly, uh, you, you can extinguish that fire by suffocating the oxygen out of it right now. But, you know, how do you fight a fire? Initially, you want to suffocate the oxygen and you can put the fire out before a lot of damage is done. Mm. But if you don't and you start just throwing water at it and it gets out of control, that's kind of what happened elsewhere. And the institutions matter, but, uh, you know, we're at, we're at the stage right now in Canada where I think we could spiral into a forest fire. I think, uh, in the, we're, we, I think it's weird. We're having a hard time here, and over the next couple of years, going to have to sort out what's Trump in style versus what's Trump in substance, all yeah. right? And I think, to I, I, yeah, the circus uh, metaphor to the town hall meetings is, is wonderful, and that's Trump in style in a postmodern sense. But distinguish that from the actual policies here is different. Yeah. Uh, and just so that we all, almost all of us weigh in on this one, um, it, you know, if you're talking specifically about the sort of post-truth aspect, the structure of the media is also very different here. The ownership media, the uh, structure of ownership is different. And we do not, at least at this point, have the kind of massive fans when little, little flames start. So I'm not willing to make a prediction one way or the other, but I, I, I mean, not only is our political system very fundamentally different, um, but also the, the media structure is different. Thank you. Um, I'm worried about, as your former professor, enforcing deadlines in a post-truth universe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi there. Uh, so this is not so much directed towards Edna and AJ's in response to some of the remarks, 
Um, so I guess I'm a little frustrated that so often like I hear Trump supporters being painted with the same brush as like, well, they're racist and that's why they voted for them and a vote for Trump is a vote for a racist America because that completely illegitimizes all of the concerns that they felt. Um, so I'm curious, I guess, um, if my phone works. Um, do you guys think that having Trump voted in as president will, I guess, quell some of the resentment that a lot of the American middle class has felt towards like the anti or the establishment and that Trump is an anti-establishment candidate will kind of get that out of their system? Or do you think that, um, as uh, Kelly said, you know, that we, this might just be, I guess, like a growing fire and that this could lead to something worse in the future? Any views on that from the panel? I mean, I, I can, I, I would throw in this, that I mean, one of the lessons I think from the management guru literature gets to your point that um, it's the vagueness with which he speaks that you can bring your own bias and, yeah. and fill in that gap. So I think in that sense, it may not be, um, if you're looking for some argument around distinction, but that, that not everyone has the same sort of racist views that were voting for Trump. Um, I think the management guru literature accommodates that by saying actually it was a wide open space, make America great again. That could be whatever you want it to mean. And it might be that people say, well that's, you know, these racists are bringing these racist view forward, but it might be that other people were saying, I'm gonna get the plant back and we're gonna start working again in Michigan, or whatever. I mean, it was, that's, that's the strategy. Keep it vague, let people bring what they want to the story, you know, or fill it in themselves. Now I'm gonna go totally outside my area of expertise other than as a political observer and journalist. Um, Trump's support is based in his ability to make people angry. And it will be very difficult for him to retain his support and, and base without that emotion. So I think it's in his interest to keep people angry. So that doesn't particularly bode well for people <coughs> thinking, okay, I, I, I cracked the nut of Washington and it's all gonna be okay now. Um, now, I'm sorry to disappoint the rest of the people at the microphones, but I think we have to call it a night. Very sorry. Very sorry. Th let's thank the panel. Can we take your question still? Thanks very much, uh, Camille. One quick round of applause for Camille Cameron. If I can just take a few seconds, I have a lot of people to thank. I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. It's yeah. been a pleasure to host this event, given the turnout. It's been fantastic. And thank you for the great uh, and insightful and interesting questions. Really appreciate that. I want to thank the President's Office and, in particular, uh, Richard, of course, Martha Casey, Aaron Stewart-Reed, very helpful in organizing the reception and uh, refreshments and the security for tonight, which was great. I want to thank Sheila Blair-Reed. Uh, she's been a real champion from the start, uh, the Director of Alumni Engagement. She has also reminded me to thank alumni for coming tonight. And any alumni who hasn't signed the sheet, the alumni sheet, if you can please do that on the way out. Sheila would be really appreciative of that. A very special thank you to uh, Genevieve McIntyre, again, our Alumni Communications Officer. Just a phenomenal job helping to organize this event and other events that we're hosting, including the Char Shalom Lecture on February 9th. Uh, Romeo Dallaire will be speaking. Um, so I, I encourage you to come to that. I want to thank the Dean moderators, uh, Sylvain Charlebois and Dean yeah. Cameron, uh, uh, Camille Cameron, for their excellent job. And I want to thank our outstanding panelists, both panels, uh, for uh, providing such important historical political, social, cultural context and insights and observations, uh, and for covering such a, a wide range of topics. These insights emerge, I, 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 I want to point out, from some of the most important teaching and research disciplines at Dalhousie. And they have never been more important and more essential for confronting what I would argue are some of the most difficult and uh, disorienting challenges of our time. And I couldn't have asked for a better illustration of that. It was a crystal clear illustration of how important the humanities and the social sciences are to this university. Thank you for coming and have a safe drive home. Thank you very much.